Why do you hate the Mormons? That's what a reporter from Newsweek magazine once asked me. I think her exact words were, why do you hate those people? And, and I share with her what I want to share with you this evening. We, we don't hate the Latter-day Saints. We love them. Uh, we appreciate them. We respect them. These are not our enemies. These are our neighbors. These are our friends. And for some of us, this is our family that we're talking about. And so we don't hate the Latter-day Saints at all, the Mormons. Now, it's true that I don't believe that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. I don't hold that the Book of Mormon is ancient scripture. I don't believe that the prophet Joseph Smith was a true prophet of God. But I love the Mormon people. In fact, let me, let me suggest to you, if you hated someone and you thought they were going in the wrong direction, if you really hated them, what would you tell them? Nothing. Yeah, you let, let them go on their way that wrong way. But it's because we love our Latter-day Saint neighbors and friends that we're compelled to share with them the alternative because we believe that they deserve uh, to hear something better. And so that's what it's all about. Uh, I've been asked before, well, James, why are you targeting the Mormons? Well, we're not, again, targeting either. It's true that we have specialized outreach to reach out to Muslims and to Jehovah's Witnesses and pretty much every faith. Uh, we have special outreach, but again, it's out of love. Just like a church will have a deaf ministry, they'll have a youth ministry. It's not because they hate deaf people or youth, they hate students. It's because they want to reach a particular people group. And I know that's why you're here this evening. You don't hate the Latter-day Saints. Many of us have friends, neighbors, family. We want to speak the truth in love. We want to be able to share the gospel effectively, and, and that's why we're here. And so what I want to do this evening... Uh, is if you're a Latter-day Saint, let me tell you, first of all, thank you for being here. You are our special guest. I would love to talk with you afterwards. I'd love to, to uh, give you a phone number where you can give me some feedback. I'd love to uh, uh, put some free materials in your hands if you'd be interested in that. I want to thank you for being here, and I want you to rest assured, everything I'm about to tell you is fully documented from the writings of the Latter-day Saint leaders, from the general authorities, from the apostles, the prophets, uh, from um, uh, general conference addresses, from church curricula. We have a significantly uh, significant Mormon library back at our headquarters in Arlington, Texas, going all the way back to the 1800s. We have over 50,000 cataloged items. The biggest section of that is our primary Mormon research, and uh, I would be more than happy to fax you or uh, scan you and provide documentation. Most of what I'm saying you're going to be familiar with uh, already, but there might be a few things I share and you go, wait a minute, I didn't know that. So give me a chance to document that from some of the top leaders of the church, and I'd love to talk with you, get your feedback uh, during our break or at the end of our, our meeting this evening. Now what I want to do, though, is I want to take you on a journey. I want to take you on a journey, my journey, from Mormonism to Christianity. I was born and raised a Latter-day Saint, a fourth generation, baptized at the age of eight years old and receiving the laying on of hands for what they call the gift of the Holy Ghost. I later received the Mormon Aaronic Priesthood and served as a deacon, teacher, and priest. Now, you should know that's very common. Almost every Mormon young man holds that priesthood in those offices. And in fact, we'll see this evening, there's a higher priesthood called the Melchizedek Priesthood, which... Uh, the Mormon church teaches is uh, the same priesthood held by Jesus Christ himself, and virtually every Mormon man holds that priesthood as well. I also did baptism work for the dead in the Salt Lake City Temple in Utah, and I'm going to explain all this to you and kind of explain what this means and what that's all about. But right up front, I do want you to know that uh, in my experience as a Latter-day Saint, I, I enjoyed my time as a Latter-day Saint, great friends. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. But I found out that it wasn't true. And uh, I never had, when I was a Latter-day Saint, an assurance that my sins were forgiven. And that's what I sought. That's what I needed. A, a certainty that my sins had been forgiven. And so I'm going to take you on that journey to help us out. It's kind of a complex story. So I've got a map for you. When you came in, you got a chart, a map. This is our guide. This is what we're going to be taking you through. And it's a fill-in-the-blank so I want to encourage you as we go through this to fill in the blanks. Did they tell you there was going to be a test? Did they tell you that part? Well, Phil, they didn't give you crayons either. I'm sorry about that. So uh, just do the best you can. Some of you have a photographic memory. You don't even need to write it down. But uh, that's for your notes. On the back, 
we have some additional documentation listed out, and we also have a list of our resources that we have available over there on that table, so you can take a look at that. Uh, but the charter diagram, I, I want to draw your attention to that. That's the map we're going to take you on. And it's basically an overview of the Mormon gospel. Now, as you look at the top, they would call that the law of eternal progression. We would often call it that. And so I want to do is take, tell you what it was like to be a Latter-day Saint, what I believe, what I hold, held dear and believed to be true, uh, that I thought was true beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so I want to take you on that and then kind of transition you what happened. But before I share with you anything out of the Book of Mormon or anything from the writings of the prophet Joseph Smith or from other, other Mormon scripture, I want to start, if I can, with God's Word. Let's start with God's Word. Turn, if you will, to Galatians chapter 1. Now, last night I shared with you, uh, those who were here last, yesterday evening, I shared with you a message called Counterfeit Christianity. And we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, particularly verse 4, and there were three warning signs. Can anybody remember the three things, three another's? Can you remember? Well, help me out. The first was another Jesus. Secondly, another spirit. spirit. And thirdly, another Wow, I'm, I, you, you guys, very good. You can preach it for me next time. Another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Now that third issue, another gospel, was picked up, uh, that theme was picked up and expanded upon. Let me, let me stop right here and talk when it talks about gospel so there's no misunderstanding. When, when Paul talks about another gospel, he's not talking about like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels. These are the written accounts of the life of, of Jesus on this earth. He's not talking about some like the Gnostic Gospels or the Gospel of Mary Magdalene or the Gospel of Judas. He's not talking about another Gospel. He's talking about the plan of salvation, a way a person saved. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, the Apostle Paul clearly articulates in the opening verses what the Gospel is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's it. If you add anything to that, if you're saved by what Jesus did plus anything else, then you have a different gospel. It's not Jesus plus tithing. It's not Jesus plus diet. It's Jesus alone. He pays it all. Jesus is the Savior, not us. And so that he articulates that. But he also picks up in Galatians chapter 1 and kind of expands that. So that another gospel. Let's look at Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Paul writes and he says, I'm amazed. I'm shocked. Uh, flabbergasted. I'm amazed that you are uh, so quickly deserting him who, call, look at this, who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Now, initially, the people living there in Galatia had embraced, he calls it the grace of Christ. Does anybody know what the word grace means? Unmerited favor, undeserved kindness, the free gift that Christ died for our sins. Initially, they embraced the, the grace of Christ, but they were abandoning it for a different gospel, uh, verse 7, which is really not another one. Really not another. Okay, was it another gospel, or was it really not another gospel? Sounds like confusing, right? Well, you have to remember what that word gospel means. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. He says, you're abandoning the, the, the true grace gospel for another good news, which really isn't good at all. So this other good news is really what bad news. And why? It says in verse 7. Only there are some who trouble or disturbing you and want to distort or like to twist the gospel of Christ. I think verse 8 is the key. But even if we or an angel from heaven. Now Paul says, what if we apostles were to come to you? Or how about better? What if an angel from heaven was to come down today? It's, an, it's interesting the number of religions that began with the appearance of an angel. In uh, Islam, you have the prophet Muhammad goes out to the cave in the Harad, in the mountain, and um, he hears the voice of an angel, Jibril, Gabriel, who says, Quran, recite. And out of that, we have a new scripture, we have a new prophet, we have a new religion, we have a new gospel. In Mormonism, it was a different angel, an angel named Moroni, who allegedly appears in Joseph Smith's bedroom in the 1820s and tells him about some sacred gold plates in which there's a scripture that later comes out and translated into a book called the Book of Mormon. But here's the point. Even if we, the apostles, or even an angel, it says verse 8, an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to, the, to what we have preached to you, 
he is to be accursed. And that's why this is such bad news, because if the gospel that you're following is not the grace gospel, it's not just a, well, um, it's not just a mistake. This is a deadly mistake. It's uh, the, the people who promote that, uh, the messenger, is to be a curse. So what I want to do is I want to take our chart, kind of take you through this, this gospel, and see, is this the gospel of grace Paul preached? Is the Mormon gospel line up with that? Or, in fact, do we have a different gospel, another gospel? Now, we would call, as you see at the top of the chart, we would often call, as Mormons, we would say we would call the gospel the law of eternal progression, but a more common term, we would often call it the restored gospel. We would say, I would say, I believe the restored gospel. Now, the reason we call it the restored gospel is extremely important. Now, this is recounted in Mormon scriptures itself. Joseph Smith's history, which is found in the Pearl of Great Price, one of the Mormon scriptures, it talks about why the gospel is the restored gospel. Joseph Smith claimed that back when he was 14 years old, he tells the story as an adult. But he says, back when I was 14 years old, let me tell you what happened. I didn't know what church to join. Now, the Mormon scriptures gives three examples. He, didn't, he said he didn't know if he should be a Presbyterian, a Methodist, or a Baptist. Or perhaps join one of the other churches. So after reading James chapter 1, uh, the prophet Joseph Smith says, I decided to seek God, to ask God in prayer ask of God. So I went out into a wooded area. The Mormons refer to this as the sacred grove near his home in Palmyra, New York. And he kneeled down in the woods and he prayed this prayer there in the wooded area. And he prayed and asked God um, basically what church he ought to join. Now, in answer to this prayer, two beings or personages appeared to Joseph Smith, identifying themselves as God the Eternal Father and his son, Jesus Christ. In answer to the prayer, what church to join, Jesus warns Joseph, don't join any church. They're all false. All of their creeds are an abomination. Now, the creeds are what the churches believe. The Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, more recently, Westminster Confession, uh, Baptist Faith and Message. This, this is what the churches believe. Not partially wrong, not incomplete, all of their creeds are an abomination in God's sight. The professors of those religions are all corrupt, the Mormon scripture says. And they preach for the commandments of God, the doctrine of men. He was to join no church because, come to find out, there is no true church or any true gospel. Joseph Smith later learns that there has been a great apostasy. Shortly after the death of the original apostles back in the first century, true Christianity and the true gospel disappeared off the earth. No one could accept the gospel for, for millennia, for, for, uh, for uh, centuries rather, for centuries because there was no true gospel on the earth until Joseph Smith is to restore it. So for, for 14, 1500 years, there's no gospel on the earth. Joseph Smith is tasked to restore the gospel. That's why we would call it the restored gospel. And that happened uh, 10 years after the first vision in 1820. That happens in the year 1830. So as a Latter-day Saint, when I was told that our church is Christian, obviously it's the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But not only are we Christian, we're the only true church on the face of the earth because we're the only ones that with the restored gospel. And there was no gospel until, for 16, 1,500 years until Joseph Smith restores it. That happens in 1830. Now, when you restore something, by definition, it's supposed to match the Original. I mean, that's what restoration means, right? For example, now I love classic cars. I love classic cars. Now, I'm not going to show you any pictures of my grandchildren. I'm going to resist that temptation. But let me show you this picture of this 1957 Chevy. Let's say I'm going to restore this. But why? Guys, am I right? There's nothing like a 1957 Chevy. Nothing like a 1957 Chevy. So I'm going to, as an act of love, I'm going to completely restore this. Ignore that, what it looks like right now, because it can be restored. And so I'm going to, everything, the, uh, the paint, the upholstery, the headliner, a blueprint, the engine, the lug nuts, everything. I want to be exactly like it rolled off the showroom floor in 1957 Chevy. So finally, three years and a small fortune later, I complete the project. I'm so excited so I'm going to throw a big party at my house, and you're invi invited. So I take you into my backyard and show you my completely restored 1957 Chevy. <laughs> and you say, James, we have to talk. 
I say, what's wrong? Well, that's not technically a 57 Chevy. This is what we would call a motor home. This is a Winnebago. Now, you have just hurt my feelings. You understand how hard I worked on this? How much money I put into this project? But see, the issue in restoration is not how sincere you are. There's only one question that does it match the original. That's what Paul's talking about in Galatians chapter 1. If even an angel or anybody comes to you and, and they, they bring you a gospel, does it match the original? Is it a restoration? Or do you have a Winnebago? Do you have some kind of different vehicle? So what my job is this evening, in my journey, I'm going to share with you what I was taught was the gospel. And your job at every point is to answer the question, is this a match? Is this the grace gospel Paul preached, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 15? Or is it another gospel that he warns about in Galatians chapter 1 and other places? So I'm going to take you on that journey. If you look at your chart, you're going to see that the Mormon gospel, the restored gospel, basically answers three important questions. Good questions, really. Good questions. And the first question in the arrow at the top of the page is the question, where do we come from? I'm going to deal with that. Now, when I, when I, in just a minute, when I deal with the question, where do we come from, I need you to suspend your disbelief for a moment. I need you to be very open-minded because we're going to have to think outside the box, way outside the box. Could you have actually lived somewhere else before you came to live on planet Earth? Now, that's what we're going to deal with. That's question one, where do we come from? Question two in the white box right underneath that is the question, why are we here? What's the purpose of life? What does God require of us? Uh, as the creeds like to ask, what's, what is the chief end of man? As the Bible asks the, the, the same question, what must I do to be saved? Oh, that's going to be question number two, why are we here? And the third question in the yellow box at the bottom of the page, very important question, where are we going? What does happen to us upon death? So I want to answer those questions, and you see question one forms an arrow at the top of the page, uh, and the arrow is question one, where did we come from? Now, there's a very big arrow, and what I'm, try I'm trying to help you here. I'm trying to, uh, it's pointing to the answer. So I'm trying, big hint, big hint, there's the answer. Where did we come from? I was taught that far away in a distant part of the universe, there's a giant star. And the name of that star is called Kolob. So if you're taking notes, that's K-O-L-O-B. A giant star, a thousand times larger than the sun in our solar system, than our sun. A giant star. And uh, this is talked about uh, in the Mormon scriptures. One of their scriptures is called the Pearl of Great Price. And in there, there's a book called the Book of Abraham. And if you see there, there's some Egyptian uh, diagrams and, and uh, writing in, in there, reproduced in that. And there's explanations, and it talks about Kolob in the Mormon scriptures. And Kolob... It's very important because this star is near the star nearest the celestial residence of our Heavenly Father. God lives here uh, near the star Kolob. And God's name is Elohim. Elohim is the name of our Heavenly Father. Now, um, I later, when I, uh, when I uh, took Greek and Hebrew, I discovered that Elohim is actually a Hebrew vocabulary word. For God. But as a Mormon, I was taught, no, this is no mere vocabulary word. It's the personal name of our Heavenly Father, Elohim, God, lives near the star Kolob. Now, we have it pictured here on your chart as a, as a planet near the star Kolob in a place that they would sometimes refer to as the first estate, or the other name for it, if you're filling in the blanks, is the pre-existence. Now, we don't know where this is, uh, you know, what galaxy this is in, or, you know, where this is located, but somewhere out there. And this is by revelation from the prophet Joseph Smith translating ancient Egyptian documents in the book of Abraham, which is in the Pearl of Great Price. And so, he Heavenly Father lives on the planet near the star Kolob, and he lives there along with Heavenly Mother. Now, I touched on this last night. I, I was taught as a Mormon that that God is actually married, so there's Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. Uh, and this is, this is very unusual because I don't know of any time in church history, we have files on thousands of religions, I don't know of any religion before Joseph Smith that would claim to be Christian and also claim to have male and female deity, the Heavenly Father, also his wife, Heavenly Mother. So God and his wife 
live um, in the pre-existence or in the first estate, and Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, um, they have children. The same way that human parents have children, our Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother procreate offspring. Now, these children uh, are not physical beings. They are spirit children, but they are nevertheless the literal offspring of these eternal parents. So Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother have children. They have a lot of children, a a very large family, Uh, extremely large. I mean, not, not millions, actually Billions. Now, I'm, I'm striking right now at the very heart of question number one. What was, what's, what's question one? Yeah, where did we come from? I was taught that everybody in the room this evening, not everybody even alive on the earth right now, before we came to this earth, we used to live in the pre-existence. We are those children. Now, when we were born to these heavenly parents, we looked a lot like we do now, except we had spirit intangible spirit bodies rather than physical bodies but we we look the same as we did now we 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 had friends relationships in fact if i was still a mormon i might even make this challenge to you 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 raise your hand have you ever had this happen raise your hand have you ever met someone it was uncanny as soon as you met them it was like you had known them your entire life raise your hand if that's ever happened to you well see ma'am you probably knew that person here on the planet near the star Okay, she's not convinced. But could you see how some of this might sound plausible or reasonable? Or you think, well, that's a deja vu. Or, yeah, how do you explain that? Is this possibly true? Is that, that, uh, um, it sounds logically true. But see, these are all the wrong questions. The question this evening is not, is this possible? Or is this logical? Or is this probable? No, the question this evening is, is this biblical? Is this the same gospel found in the pages of the New Testament? Or do we have, as Paul warned, another gospel which is not the grace of Christ and not the grace gospel at all? I was taught as a Latter-day Saint that we were all up there with Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. And it was determined early on that we would one day need to have a Savior. And there were actually two candidates to be the Savior of mankind. There were two candidates, a Republican and a Democrat. (laughs) You knew I was kidding about that part, didn't you? No. But there were two candidates. Jesus offered to be the Savior of mankind, our older brother Jesus. But so did his spirit brother named Lucifer. I was taught that Jesus and Lucifer are actually spirit brothers along with the rest of us. Now... When Lucifer, um, he presented a plan of salvation in which he would basically require everyone to follow Heavenly Father. He would take away their freedom, everyone's freedom of choice, or what they would call their free agency or agency. And he would basically, if he's the Savior, everybody's going to be forced to follow, the, follow after God, uh, after our Heavenly Father. Jesus, on the other hand, in accordance with Heavenly Father's desire, wanted to preserve our agency to let us choose whether or not to follow God or not. Jesus was chosen to be our Savior. Now, when Lucifer was not allowed to be our Savior, at this point he becomes very angry, angry. And he's able to somehow convince approximately one-third of us to join with him. So a war broke out between Lucifer and some of our brothers and sisters with us there was a war we were all up there in this great battle that took place this great war lucifer uh, and his forces versus us and jesus and heavenly father i know you don't remember any of this but you've lost the memory of that but that i was told this is what happened so let's do a little review if we review we all came from where the planet near the star kolob now in this war that took place lucifer and the people who, our brothers and sisters who decide to, to, uh, to fight with him, what happens is they lose the war. And when Lucifer and the third of our brothers and sisters lose the war, they're cursed. And part of the curse is never to be able to have a body of flesh and bone, which is very important. So they're cursed. They can never have bodies of flesh and bone. And they become the demons. So where did the demons come from? It's our brothers and sisters who fought on the side of Lucifer. Now, this, 
you know, this is a little bit like the Bible. The, the Bible does talk about a great war and a third of the host of heaven being cast out. But in this great war before the creation of the world, uh, who fought in that war? Was that human beings? Who was it? Angels, not humans. But now, let me take you kind of where we're going. From a Mormon perspective, angels and demons and humans and deity are actually different manifestations of the same species, same DNA. And so, in a sense, they would say, yes, angels, us, same difference. But they became the demons. Now, I was taught, let me say this, that the Mormon church is, is really trying to backpedal and spin some things in recent uh, years. They produced a couple of uh, several white papers or essays that they put up on their website where they try to explain away uh, some of the problems like Joseph Smith's polygamy. Uh, a lot of modern Mormons didn't even know about the polygamy. I knew about it, but I didn't know the details. I did not know that some of Joseph Smith's wives were as young as 14 years old. And I certainly didn't know that a third of Joseph Smith's wives were simultaneously married to other living men, Mormon leaders. See, I did not know that. So the Mormon church is trying to address that. The big enemy of the Mormon church right now is uh, not our ministry, Watchman Fellowship. It's Google, because information is out there now, and they're having to explain away. I was taught... My parents, my grandparents, um, this is from, from general conference addresses, the apostles, prophets taught. They're trying to, say, they're trying to back away from it now, but they, I was taught that there were some of our brothers and sisters who were not valiant. Some Mormon leaders have even suggested they were neutral, neither choosing the side of Jesus nor the side of Lucifer. But most Mormon leaders would argue, no, they weren't neutral. They did choose to fight on the right side, but they did not fight valiantly. Bravely. Well, who are these people? Uh, God cursed them to never to be able to hold the Mormon priesthood in this dispensation. So they're able to come to earth and have bodies, but they're not allowed to hold the priesthood or go into the temples in this dispensation. And so we could recognize the people who lacked valor. God placed a mark on those people, and that mark was a dark skin. You need to understand that the Mormon church has had a history of racism from the days of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young until fairly recently, until 1976, 1978 rather, 1978. No black person was allowed to go into a Mormon temple. You could not uh, receive your endowments. Uh, you could not hold the priesthood. However, in 1978, there was a new revelation. And from 1978 forward, those of all color, including blacks, can now go into the temple, can now, if they're worthy, and they can also hold the priesthood. And in fact, that new change about blacks being allowed to come into the priesthood, I believe, sparked another change in the Book of Mormon. In the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi, chapter 30, verse 6, in, in virtually every edition of the Book of Mormon from the original 1830 up until 1974, every Book of Mormon would say that there were dark-skinned people in the Book of Mormon, that they were cursed and given a dark skin because of their wickedness. Second Nephi chapter 30, verse 6, though, promised that if they would repent, they would eventually become, quote, white and delightsome, end quote. Now, can you guess how many black Mormons were becoming white after 1978? Any guesses on that? Not Michael Jackson. Who said that? Not, no, no. Michael Jackson was a Jehovah's Witness, not a Mormon. Good guess, though. The, the correct answer I'm looking for it would be zero. And so what happened in the very next edition, the 1981 edition, that verse is changed. And the new, the new Book of Mormon now takes out the reference to skin color in 2 Nephi chapter 30, verse 6. So um, the Mormon church is now trying to spin that to say it was never a doctrine. That they, they don't really know why black people didn't hold the priesthood all those uh, uh, decades. Uh, maybe... Um, it was a, a, a policy that was never reviewed. And they try to put a lot of the blame like it was Brigham Young's fault. So you can read the essay. You can go to mormon.org and read that essay if you want. But it's interesting how uh, everything's constantly changing in Mormonism. And what's tr true today might not be true the next day. So that basically answers question number one. Where do we come from? We came from the planet near the star Kolob, the pre-existence of the first estate. Uh, and it takes us now to question two, why are we here? 
So here's where we were. We were, you know, in the pre-existence. But why are we here? We're here on earth. If you're taking notes, it's also known as the second estate. The second estate. So, um, but the question is not where are we. Uh, but by the way, one year we uh, published a chart similar to this in one of our magazines. And the woman who did the, the graphic arts for us there, she put an X by the earth and put, you are here. <laughs> you ever get lost at the mall? Now, I know I've lost half of you already. You're on earth, okay? You with me on that? You're on earth. But the question is not why are you here, the, uh, or not where are you. The question is why are you here? Now, this is a much more important question than it first appears. Because remember, according to Mormonism, we were already in the presence of God. Why would we ever want to leave the presence of God? Now, I was told that uh, in, the, in the great council in the preexistence that all of us, we don't remember it, but we were all uh, told the restored gospel. We were all, it was explained to us. And our hearts leapt with joy when we heard of the opportunity and potential. And all of us said, yes, yes, we want to leave the presence of God. We want to come to earth. But we do so at great risk. Because it is potentially, it's possible to lose everything. Why would we take such a risk? We're about to see. If you're successful, the potential is unlimited. So let me get to why we're here. Now, I could give you 30 or 40 essential things of why we're here and document. But what I want to do is I've simplified it to nine basic things. Nine basic requirements. Why are we here? So let's build that list here. That's in the middle of your page. Why are we here? Number one, we are here to receive a body. Now, remember, before we come here, we have spirit bodies. This is the law of eternal progression, and you cannot progress with a spirit body. You must gain a physical, tangible body. So reason number one, why are we here? To gain a physical body. Okay, let me just kind of get a feel for everyone. How many of you believe you may have already accomplished step one? Would you? It's about half of you. Okay, listen, I'm going to give you all credit on this one. Just kind of follow along with me. Check it off. You all get credit on this one. Receive a body. So... Step one, receive a body. Number two, you are here to be able to experience sin. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. The Latter-day Saints, Mormon people are not, they, you know, they don't promote sinful living. And if you have any Mormon neighbors, you probably know, for the most part, they're going to be very righteous, good neighbors and friends. They want to live wholesome lives. However, part of the gospel, the restored gospel, is that you have to be put into an environment where you can choose to sin. Remember that free agency I talked about? See, we can't choose to sin in the presence of God. There can be no sin in God's presence. But in the second estate, we can choose to sin. We have that agency. We can either choose to sin, or we can choose not to sin. Now, unfortunately, we all chose to sin. But that's part of the gospel. We're here to, number one, Receive a body, number two, experience sin. Number three, we must have faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. Now, here was something we would certainly be in agreement with our Latter-day Saint neighbors and friends. We also agree that essential to the gospel is to have faith in Christ. But let me tap the brakes for just a moment. Remember the message last night? What did 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4 warn us about? We have to watch out, have faith in Christ, but beware of what? another Jesus. So the earlier question I think we need to address is, is the Jesus of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is that the traditional Christ of, of the Bible? Is that the same Jesus we believe in, the traditional Christ? Let me say this, I, I could do a whole you know, evening just on this one topic, so I can only touch on it briefly. Let me just assure you that the Jesus I believe in today is not at all the same Jesus I believed in when I was a Latter-day Saint. Uh, I, don't, I no longer believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. I believe Jesus has always been God. He did not achieve deity. I, I believe that Jesus, uh, as a Mormon, I was taught that Jesus was married. Uh, early Mormon apostles talked about Jesus being married to Mary, her sister Martha and Mary Magdalene had three wives. I don't believe that anymore. As a Latter-day Saint, I was taught that Jesus was not begotten of the Holy Spirit. Brigham Young made this very clear. Uh, Christ was not begotten of the Holy Ghost. Um, 
I was taught that the way Christ was conceived is that Heavenly Father came to this earth, married the Virgin Mary, and begot the Savior naturally. Now, a lot of Mormons have not heard about this doctrine. You know, my family goes back four generations. Uh, but it's clearly written in the uh, Orson Pratt, um, uh, the Seer, other sources where apostles, top-level general authorities, talked about Jesus being married. Also talked about Heavenly Father marrying the Virgin Mary and go into detail on that. A lot of modern Mormons don't know about that or hold to that doctrine. I was taught uh, and believed that the Book of Mormon teaches that after Christ died on the cross and was resurrected, Jesus actually comes to America to preach the gospel to the Native Americans or the Indians who are actually Jewish, according to the Book of Mormon. Um, I don't have time to get into that deeply, but uh, one of the real problems is the Book of Mormon explains where the Native Americans come from. In this Book of Mormon, the introduction page, and for decades, it said that the, um, the, this Jewish family, Lehi and his two sons, come to America, and that the, the, the Lamanites, one of the descendants of one of the sons, becomes the primary ancestor, principal ancestor, it says, of the American Indian. Well, that we, that's... That's not true. We know that's not true. Uh, the recent evidence to prove it is DNA. They've tracked, checked all the DNA now of virtually every tribe, Cheyenne, Apache, Seminole here in Florida, uh, the um, uh, Eskimo. They've even now, they, they can have the technology to get the, the uh, DNA analysis from extinct or uh, ancient groups like the Toltec, Aztec, Inca, Maya. None of the DNA is Jewish DNA. All the DNA tracks from Siberia, Mongolia, Northeast Asia. It's an Asian DNA, not an Israelite DNA. And uh, you have Mormon scientists now who are, are panicking on this. Um, uh, Dr. Thomas Murphy, still Mormon, but he's at the place where he be believed uh, that the Book of Mormon is inspired fiction. A story like a parable never actually happened, but it's a, a story that could, uh, God might use to warm your heart. I think he's even progressed beyond that at this point. So, um, th th but Jesus visits the America. I don't believe that anymore. Uh, I could go through a lot of different um, differences, but what I want to do this evening is ask you not to take my word on it. I'm just James Walker. Let me take you to the top Mormon himself. This is the prophet, seer, revelator, president of the Mormon church, who passed away recently, about nine years ago. His name is Gordon B. Hinckley. And here's what President Hinckley said. And this is in the LDS Church News. In bearing testimony of Jesus Christ, President Hinckley spoke of those outside the church who say, Latter-day Saints do not believe in the traditional Christ. Listen to his answer. No, I don't. The traditional Christ of whom they speak is not the Christ of whom I speak. Now, I, I appreciate his candor, and I, would, I need to acknowledge that probably most Mormons don't know this. When I was a Latter-day Saint, I thought everybody had the same Jesus, whether you were Mormon or Presbyterian or Baptist or Catholic or Buddhist or Muslim. If you said Jesus, we're all talking about the same person, right? The Mormon prophet does know the difference, though. Now, if you read the whole article, he makes the case that we have the wrong Jesus, and that they have the correct Jesus, and he bases it on that vision that Joseph Smith had in 1820 when he met Jesus. And so he makes the case, but at least he's acknowledging it's not the same Jesus, and I, I certainly appreciate uh, that honesty and candor. So we talked about our list. We talked about receiving a body, why that's important, experiencing sin, experiencing sin having faith in Christ. Number four, we must repent of our sin. We must repent of our sin. Now, again, even the definition of repentance is different. We kind of saw this last night as well. You see how groups out there, which we would classify as counterfeit Christianity, hey, they use a lot of the right words. God, Jesus, salvation, scripture. Here's the problem. They use our vocabulary, but they have a different dictionary. So if a Mormon, if I'm a Mormon, I ask you, um, do you believe the scriptures? What do you answer? You better answer, what do you mean by scripture? <laughs> because I might be talking about the Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, where you're just thinking the 66 books of the Bible. So the lesson learned, define your terms. 
or you're, you're going to think you agree when you don't agree. So repentance in Mormonism um, is a little different than what we would call repentance or change of direction. Uh, the closing chapters of the Book of Mormon make it clear that in order to truly repent, in order to be right with God, for God's grace to be sufficient, you basically have to stop sinning. Um, Spencer W. Kimball, one of the prophets uh, of the Mormon Church, recent prophet in his book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, said that in order to, to be forgiven of your sin, you must repent of the sin. In order to be sufficiently repentant, you must never repeat the sin, not even in your mind. If you do, all those other sins come back on your head, basically. And so, uh, you, not only are you guilty of the new sin you just did, but all those other sins you thought you repented of, obviously you didn't because you just repeated the sin. And so, uh, it's a different understanding of uh, repentance. But nevertheless, this is one of the, one of the requirements. Repentance, um, uh, the, let me say this. The Book of Mormon says this. It kind of sums it up. The Book of Mormon says... By grace are we saved after all we can do. The grace only comes in after you get... Let me ask this. Have you ever had a, 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 a night when you went, put your head on your pillow to go to sleep to thinking you've done all you could do that day? There, there's nothing, nothing else you could have done. And so that's, that's, that's the kind of grace it's talking about. So repentance, number, number five. Number six. Uh, number five, rather. Rep, repentance is four. Number five, baptism. Baptism is necessary for the gospel, but for the baptism to be valid, you must be baptized by one having the proper authority, meaning a Mormon priesthood holder. Any other baptism is invalid. So it must be by immersion, but it has to be a Mormon who holds the priesthood who's baptizing you. Any other baptism, uh, you just got wet is all. So um, baptism, number six, you must receive the Holy Ghost. This is, again, it's a ritual that's done by the laying on of hands by one having the proper authority. Again, a Latter-day Saint who holds the priesthood authority and can bestow the, the, the Holy Ghost upon you. Number six, receive the Holy Ghost. Number seven, you must obey the laws of the gospel. Now, th this is an important point because this kind of really clearly differentiates when Paul talked in Galatians 1 about the grace of Christ Watch out for a, another gospel. And this kind of clarifies it. I was taught that the gospel, well, not just the gospel, as a Mormon, I was taught every blessing. Every blessing we receive, any blessing you receive from God, is predicated upon your obedience to the corresponding principle. You don't get the blessing without the obedience to match that whatever that you're trying to obtain. Now, this particular number seven, obey the laws, I'm taking this directly from the prophet Joseph Smith. In the Mormon scriptures, Pearl of Great Price, they have the articles of faith, and uh, 13 of them. And when I was in uh, elementary school, they call it primary, I had to memorize all 13 articles of faith. And one of them that really stuck in my mind uh, was article three. And let me read to the, from the Mormon scriptures. Here's what Joseph Smith said. Quote, we believe that through the atonement of Christ... All mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Let me ask you something. Is that the gospel of grace that Paul was talking about, the grace of Christ, or is this a different gospel? Are we saved by our obedience to the laws and ordinances? No, we're not at all. Well, because, well, quite frankly, you're not very obedient. That's one reason it's not. Uh... Joseph Smith said we're saved by our our obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Which laws? The laws and ordinances of the gospel. Now, this can't be true because there are no laws in the gospel. Now, that can be a little confusing because we do know that there are many laws in the Bible, but there are no laws in the gospel because it's not a gospel, it's not good news about laws. It's a gospel of grace, not a gospel of laws. Now, there's many laws in the Bible, no laws in the gospel. For example, in the Old Testament alone, there are 613 laws. How many of you know them all? Quickly. Okay, forget the whole number 613. Let's just focus on the most important 10, the Ten Commandments. How many of you know the Ten Commandments? Okay, help me out. If you, if you can give me eight of the ten, I'm going to give you credit. Can you give me eight of the Ten Commandments? Now, think about those Ten Commandments for a moment. Have you obeyed those? 
One of them, I might remind you, says, honor your father and mother. One of the Ten Commandments, Jesus says, you know if you break it in your mind, if you break it in your heart, you've already broken it. Now, it's not that the laws are bad. You say, well, James, you're against the law. No, I think the laws are wonderful. The reason the laws are so good is because they reflect the purity and righteousness of the holy God that we worship. God is that good. That's good. The problem is we're not. So that's why we're not saved by keeping laws. Joseph Smith has it exactly wrong. We're not saved by our ability to keep laws. Think of it this way. The laws work um, like this. Let's say that you uh, slip on a sidewalk, you hurt your shoulder, and along around 1 o'clock in the morning, the pain is so bad you just can't. Some of you have done this. You know what I'm talking about. The pain's so bad you just can't stand it anymore. Where do you go? ER. You go to ER. And after you've waited a couple of hours in the waiting room, they're going to take you back and they're going to shoot a picture called a what? X-ray. They developed that. Some of you have been in that room. They put it up on the wall and turned that light switch on. You've seen that? Remember that? And they show you that little line that's causing all the pain. And they said, the reason you're in so much pain, see that little line right there? It's a fracture. You've broken the bone. Now, what if you were to say, thank you so much, doctor. Now, how many more x-rays until I'm healed? Well, you've misunderstood the purpose of an x-ray. You'll never be healed by a million x-rays. The purpose of an x-ray is to show you that you need to be healed. But the x-rays have no power to heal. The purpose of the law is, a, is to show you that you need a Savior. But the law is not your Savior. Your Savior is named Jesus, not the laws. So the law does a job of showing you that when you compare yourself with the righteousness and holiness of God, you fall sh so short, even on your best day, you, you can't be right with God by keeping the law. Let's contrast how Joseph Smith says we're saved Back to the Apostle Paul. How does Paul say that we're saved in the Bible? Romans chapter 3, verse 20. He says, Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Oh, okay, stop right there. How many people get saved by keeping the law? So that would be less than 20, would you say? Yeah, no flesh, that's zero. That's the answer I'm looking for, zero. Joseph Smith is telling us the wrong gospel. We're, we're not saved by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. See, that's what I'm telling you. It's your x-ray. It tells you you're broken. It tells you you need to be healed, but it's not your Savior. And he says, uh, he kind of wraps up and um, he concludes in verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That is a totally different gospel than, than what we find in the articles of faith by the prophet Joseph Smith. We go back to our list here on our chart. Were you with me? Receive a body, experience sin, have faith in Christ. What else? Repentance, baptism, receive the Holy Ghost. We talked about obeying the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Number eight, though, see, that's not enough, just those laws. and You've got to become temple worthy. Temple worthy. Let me tell you how that works. Temple worthy means... Um, there's only about 140 temples in the entire world. Now, Mormon churches are ubiquitous. I mean, they're, they're building them every day. They build one or two new Mormon churches. I mean, just to keep up with the growth, especially internationally right now. Now, if you go to the Mormon, you know where the Mormon church here in Pensacola, you know where that is? You ever seen it? If you go there, it's going to be visitors are welcome. They'll have a special class for you, investigators class. They're very friendly people. Uh, and they certainly will roll out the red carpet and, and you'll be treated uh, you know, as a visitor, as a great visitor and friend. That's the Mormon church, the ward, ward chapel, they call it. Now, the Mormon temple is a whole different story. The Mormon temple is not open to the public. Uh, and in fact, interestingly, even most Mormons are not allowed to go inside the Mormon temple. In order to go, gain inside, you have to go number eight on your list. You have to become temple worthy. Now, for a Latter-day Saint to become temple worthy, you must successfully be able to pass two interviews. You're going to be interviewed, first of all, by your bishop, which is like your pastor, local pastor. And if you pass that interview, you get a second interview with his supervisor, the stake president. And in those offices, they're going to ask you, in fact, this is in their manual, they have specific questions they're going to ask you. They're going to ask you very direct personal questions to find out if you're worthy, and you've got to answer truthfully. Okay, 
here's what I'm going to do. If I can get away with that, I think I can. I, can I just be your bishop and take you through an interview? I'm going to be the bishop, and um, you're good people. We'll see how you do on this. So if I was your bishop, and we could just do it as a group and do it with the raised hand. They do it privately, but we'll just do it as a group. They're going to ask you, first of all, what they call word of wisdom questions. Word of wisdom questions. So I'll just ask, start with this. You just raise your hand. How many of you drink coffee or tea? Coffee or tea? Okay. You're all disqualified. Yeah, you don't even make it a question two. Right there. You, have, you are not temple worthy. Um, in fact, if you're seen coming out of a Starbucks, you may have some explaining to do. So you, no coffee, tea, or tobacco products. Uh, chewing tobacco, cigarettes, no alcoholic beverages. This all comes under the heading that they would call Word of Wisdom. They're also going to ask you questions about what reading material you have. They're going to ask you, for example, do you have any anti-Mormon literature in your home or office? Um, they'll ask you, do you have sympathies for um, apostates or apostate organizations? If you're a supporter of our ministry, Watchman Fellowship, it will not go well for you in that interview. Uh, then they're going to ask you, they always ask you, both of them will ask you this question. And I'm going to ask you not to raise your hand on this question. But they're going to ask you this question. Have you given 10% of your income to the church of Jesus Christ, to the, to the church? 10% of your income. Are you a full and honest tithe payer? Now, if you answer no to that question, it's really not the end of the world because they will ask you the follow-up question. Would you like to make a settlement at this time? Now, if you answer no to that question, it is the end of the world. Your salvation is based in part on whether or not you get inside that building. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm a member at Fielder Church, Fielder Road Baptist Church back in Arlington, Texas, and I believe in supporting my church with tithes and offerings. And I hope if you're a member here at Olive Baptist Church, you fully support what God's doing here financially. That's God's way. But that's not how, the, the, that's not the gospel. That's what Christians ought to do. But we're not saved by that. In fact, any of you yesterday put an offering to the plate thinking that helped to make you worthy. I suggest you call the church in the morning, ask for a refund, because I can promise you the money you give does not make you worthy. True Christians give because of a relationship they have with God, not in order to gain or earn that relationship with God. You understand the difference here. Now, if you're not a full tithe payer, and there's other questions as well, but if you successfully get through that interview, then you have a similar interview with your stake president. If you successfully pass both interviews, you're given a coveted, uh, they call it a temple recommend. I believe it's valid now. I think the, the ones now are valid for 24 months. This is the card that gets you in the temple. Now, um, and it takes us to number nine, finally on this number nine, temple ordinances. Uh, what happens when you go inside the temple? Let me say that there are certain, the reason this is so important, there are certain ordinances that happen inside the temple that cannot happen in any other building. Uh, they are so essential, uh, and you can't do them in a church. You have to do them in one of the 140 temples. One of those things is baptism for the dead, and I'm going to explain more of that to you in just a moment. So baptism for the dead. But the other thing that happens in the temple and can only happen in the temple is to be married and sealed to your spouse for time and all eternity. Now, if you're a Mormon and you don't qualify, and most don't, if you don't qualify to have a temple recommend and you get married in a civil ceremony or with a minister, maybe even in a Mormon church, but not the temple, then there's going to be a place in the ceremony where it's going to, they're, they're going to tell you, till death do you part. How, how many of you remember when you were married? Remember the minister said, raise your hand if you can remember the minister saying, till death do you part. Now, if I could tell you a way right now, you could be married not till death, but actually for all eternity. Who would be interested in that? <laughs> One couple, help me out here. Uh, now, you probably misunderstood the question. We're going to skip that question. I strike that from the record. What we're going to do instead, let me, let me try to explain it this way. You guys are a hard group to work with, you know that? Let me explain it this way. 
as a Mormon, I'm feeling like one of the huge benefits we have is that our marriages are not, uh, if they're temple marriages, it's not till death. In fact, I talked to the mission president, uh, the temple president in Albuquerque, New Mexico last, uh, last year, the temple president, and he said that the reason the temple is so important that it was one of his marriage for all eternity, he says any other marriage begins with the decree of divorce in the very ceremony, till death do you part. We're the only church that can offer you more. So it's a huge thing. Of, you want to be married for time and all eternity, baptism of the dead as well. Now, exactly what happens in the Mormon temple? I can't tell you. It's secret. Uh, they would say it's sacred, and they don't want to talk about it because they say, well, it's sacred to us, so we don't talk about it. I don't really think it's sacred. I think it's secret. I think there's a big difference. And some, some of the ways I illustrate that to a Mormon is say, well, the temple, we can't talk about it because it's sacred. Well, let me ask you about this book right here called the Book of Mormon. Would you call it a secret book or would you call it a sacred book? Sacred book. Does that mean that no one should read it unless they're temple-worthy Latter-day Saint? No Gentile, no non-Mormon should ever read this book? No, no, we want everybody to read it. We'll give you a free copy. So let me ask you again, is it a sacred book or is it a secret book? Now let's go back to the temple for a moment. Would you call it sacred or secret? If it's sacred, don't you want everybody to see it, like the Book of Mormon? Or is it, in fact, secret? A lot of the temple ceremony, uh, there was a radical change in the temple ceremony in, in, in April of 1990. In fact, the Mormon church actually did a marketing survey. What did you most enjoy about your temple experience? What did you least enjoy about it? It's supposed to be a restoration of the Bible temple ceremonies. Let me say that while in the Bible, there were, it's true, in the, in the biblical temple, uh, in uh, Solomon's temple, uh, in Herod's temple, there were parts that were off limits to the non-Jew, to the Gentile. There were parts that were off limits to women. There was one part that only one guy could go in, the high priest, only one day out of the year, Yom Kippur, the Holy of Holies. You can only go in there once a year. However, it wasn't secret because the Bible tells us with great detail everything that happens in every room. So it's, it's there for us to read. We, we know what happened in the biblical temples because it's recorded for us in the Bible. The Mormon temple is not that way at all. A lot of this was taken from masonry. Joseph Smith was a mason, got kicked out of the masons, basically, in Nauvoo, Illinois, and uh, incorporated a lot of the secret handshakes, modified them. Uh, for example, until, until April of 1990, every Mormon that went through the temple ceremony had to place their left hand in a square, take their right thumb, place it under their throat, and draw it quickly across from one ear to the other, representing uh, being willing to have their throat cut from ear to ear rather than reveal any of what, in, what I've just told you. And so my parents took that in the Mesa Temple, those blood oaths. Uh, those were removed in April of 1990. They don't do the oaths anymore. But they go through the veil into the celestial room, which represents the, um, the uh, celestial kingdom of God, which we'll learn more about in a moment. And uh, this is very important there. Mormons are also buried in the same uh, temple clothing, all white, white shoes, white socks. The men, white trousers, white belt, white uh, tie, white shirt. The women, it's the wedding uh, outfit uh, with the veil. You see the green aprons. These aprons represent the fig leaf aprons worn by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. A perfect visual. Does anybody remember Genesis 3, the aprons that were sewed by Adam and Eve to cover their nakedness before holy God? God really liked those aprons, didn't he? Those fig leaf aprons, didn't he? No, it's always been a symbol of humans trying to cover up their sin before God in a way that's inappropriate. It took an animal dying, perhaps a lamb, to make the proper clothing. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And so what we have here is what happens in the temple. So this takes us to our final question, which is where are we going? Now, immediately upon death, I was told everybody goes to one of two places, but it's not heaven and it's not hell. You will either go to a place called paradise or an alternative, you will go to spirit prison. Now, I'm going to simplify this to some degree, but basically today, here's how it works. Only worthy Latter-day Saints go to paradise, so everyone else goes where? Spirit prison. Now, as the name implies, that's not the place you want to be. However, it's not hell in the sense we would use the term hell, it's, it's, and it's certainly not a final state. 
if you're in spirit prison, there's still an opportunity for you. If you, you can get out of spirit prison. If you um, have never had an opportunity to hear the restored gospel, and, and this is real practical. Think about people that lived in the 1400s or 1500s. Could they have heard the gospel? No, there was no gospel from the first century when it ended until Joseph Smith restores it. So none of those people had a chance. Or even today, uh, maybe you live in a part of the world where the Mormon missionaries have not shared this message with you. So if you die and go to spirit prison and never had an opportunity to hear the restored gospel, I was taught that Mormon missionaries from paradise would actually come down and share the gospel with you there. Now, it's kind of vague how this works. I've been asked, does that involve bicycles? or how They don't explain all that to you. But basically, in some manner, you will be presented with the restored gospel and you will have an opportunity to believe the gospel in spirit prison. You say, great, I believe I can go up to paradise. Not so quickly. Now, remember our list of nine requirements? One of them is you also must be baptized. You say, I was baptized in the Baptist church. Doesn't count. You have to be baptized by one having the proper authority. Well, how can I do that? I'm already dead. This is where the doctrine of baptism for the dead comes in. The Mormon church owns the world's largest genealogical library, family history library. There in Utah, it's literally million, names of millions and millions of dead people. They have the records of that. They store these names. They're sent electronically, uh, satellite communication, to one of the 140 temples around the world. This is what I did in the Salt Lake City Temple. I was, there was a beautiful temple. I, I have my recommend. I come in. Uh, I was dressed in total white from head to toe. They take me into a beautiful room, and in the center of the room is a gold baptismal font supported by 12 golden oxen. I remember walking up those steps and walking down to the waters of baptism, but not to be baptized for me. I had already been baptized in a regular Mormon church. This was not baptism for me. It was baptism for the dead by proxy. I took on the name of about uh, probably about a half a dozen dead people, and I was baptized and confirmed and received the laying on of hands for these dead people. For example, one of the men I was baptized for, the first one was named Frederick Jones. And the Mormon official says, I baptize you, Frederick Jones, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, put me down in the water and brought me up. And I was convinced at that baptism, if the dead man, Frederick Jones, had received the Mormon gospel, believed in spirit prison, he then could go up to paradise. Now, here's the catch. We don't know who's received the Mormon gospel in spirit prison and who hasn't. So everybody gets baptized for the day because you don't know who it's going to work on and who it's not going to work on. So anybody, if you have a family member who's passed away two years ago or longer, I can virtually guarantee you they've already done this. In their genealogical records, you can look up which temple did it, what the date was, they've done bad. Your relative has now been baptized a Mormon, baptized for the dead. Uh, they've been baptized for the dead for all the Catholic popes, uh, baptized for the dead for... Um, uh, all the uh, reformers, Calvin, Zwingli, Martin Luther, uh, they've been baptized. Adolf Hitler has been baptized for the dead and married for all eternity to Eva Braun. They also not only do baptism for the dead, they also do marriage for the dead. Living Mormon couples will take on the name of dead couples to go through the sealing ceremony so that dead couple, uh, what, what you saw taking place in the veil ceremony, etc., for and on behalf of the dead. The majority of what happens in the Mormon church is a temple, rather, the Mormon temple is actually works for dead people. You say, oh, I thought that's where they worship on Sunday. No, the temples are all closed on Sunday. It's for the works for the dead, primarily for works for the dead. And so if you get to go up to paradise, you say, well, you, you made it to the end. Not exactly, because this is the law of eternal progression. I was taught that by the at least by the end of the millennial reign of Christ on earth, there's going to be a final judgment, and virtually everyone, virtually everyone, will end up going to heaven, but the question is which heaven? If you look on your chart, uh, the, the bottom heaven is called the telestial kingdom. It's represented by the light of a star, the, the faint twinkle of a star. That, that heaven, the telestial kingdom, I was taught was beautiful, glorious, majestic, anything you could imagine heaven to be, that is the telestial kingdom. But I had no desire to go there when I was a Latter-day Saint. In fact, I, I would feel if I went to heaven, if I, if I went to that heaven, I would be a total failure. 
Because there's a heaven higher than that called the terrestrial kingdom. And that's represented by a brighter light than the light of the star. It's the light of the moon. The terrestrial kingdom, even more glorious and beautiful. But as you already can guess, I didn't want to go there either. My desire, my aim, uh, my goal was to be worthy to go to the highest heaven known as the celestial kingdom. That's represented by the brightest light of all, the light of the sun. So I'm going to, again, this is greatly simplifying, but it basically works this way. Only worthy Latter-day Saints go to the celestial kingdom. Or remember the other way to get there. If you accept the Mormon gospel in spirit prison and have your works done vicariously, proxy for the dead people, and you're one of them, you too potentially can go to that celestial kingdom. The bottom kingdom, now this, this is interesting really, the bottom kingdom is reserved for wicked people. If you're a murderer, you hate God, you're lawless, you don't have to be spiritual or believe anything. You go to the bottom heaven, which is much better than earth. Well, then what's the middle heaven for? The terrestrial kingdom is for good people, spiritual people, honorable people who are not obedient Latter-day Saints. So if you are a devout Muslim, if you're an observant Jew, if you're a decent Baptist, hey, you might go to that middle heaven. But listen, once you're in either of the lower heavens, you are blocked. You can never progress. Your progression is stopped. Only in the celestial kingdom can the progression continue. Now, there's one other place you need to know about, bottom, middle of the page, the bottom place. There is a place called outer darkness, which is not good. It's not heaven. It's a bad place. Uh, but don't worry, worry. It's almost impossible to go there. This is the place where Satan would go. And the, remember our brothers and sisters who sided with them? Yeah, sure, they'll go there. And only other people who go there would be sons of perdition, which is usually defined as someone who is a Latter-day Saint. And while knowing the church is true, becomes an enemy of Joseph Smith and the restored gospel. I've been accused of it on occasion, but it's interesting, in my own excommunication trial, uh, I had uh, already was involved with the Ministry of Watchman Fellowship. What got me in trouble was I helped a woman in Fort Worth come out of Mormonism to Christ. They found out it was me, and then they discovered I was actually still in the roles of the church. Here I am, the president of Watchman Fellowship, but technically I was still a Mormon on the roles. I was still in the roles of the Mormon church. Well, I had two uh, of the bishop's counselors appear in my door with what amounted to a subpoena to appear before it. There's a religious court. When I left the church, there was no honorable way out. The only way out is through either through a stake high council or a bishop's court. You must be found guilty of something. And so uh, they said, now, uh, Brother Walker, uh, we know who you are. We know what you believe. And you don't even need to attend. We can. This is just a clerical matter, but we have to tell you there will be a trial, a bishop's court. I said, I won't miss this for the world. This is going to be great. And so I had all my evidence, and it ended up running like an hour and a half. And, and uh, so finally, uh, they, they dismissed me, and then the bishop brought me back in and said, uh, stake president was there, bishop's counselor. He said, uh, Brother Walker, we hate to inform you that you've been found guilty of membership in another church. You are no longer a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I told my bishop, I said, well, I guess now, with what I'm doing, I'm a son of perdition, right? He said, oh, no, Brother Walker. You told us that you don't believe in Joseph Smith. You don't know it. You don't believe it's true. Uh, so you would not be a son of perdition. Uh, I fully expect you to be in the celestial kingdom with the other wicked people. So, uh, <laughs> hey, there's some salvation, even for James Walker, according to my, uh, my bishop. But when I was Mormon, what was I aiming for? The celestial kingdom. But look closely at the celestial. You'll see even the celestial is divided into three categories. In order to make it to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, uh, it's not enough to be worthy. You also must be married. And your spouse must be worthy also. And this is why temple marriage is so important. You have to be married for all eternity, which involves the temple. Now, if you're single... Uh, you can be a servant or slave in one of the lower levels of the, of the celestial kingdom. But in order to make it the highest, you must be married. And your salvation depends not only on your worthiness, but how worthy is your spouse. Now, um, let me ask you a few. How many of you are single? Um, well, let me ask you a real important question. Do you like anybody? Now, this is important. <laughs> because your whole salvation is hanging about in part on your marital status. 
But I was thinking if I could be married in the temple and my, my wife was worthy, I was worthy, I was hoping to go to the celestial kingdom. If I make it to the celestial, the highest degree of the celestial kingdom, now I finally made it to the top. Right? This is the law of eternal progression. What I'm about to tell you is one of the, one of the most important teachings of the church. But you'll never see it on any of their TV commercials. If you make it to the highest degree and you're worthy and you're married and you obey all the laws and ordinances, you could be eligible for something they call celestial exaltation. Now, remember question one formed an arrow from the upper right hand corner of your chart to the upper left hand corner of your chart. I was taught if I could make it to the highest degree and my wife both, then my wife and I would be given some other world somewhere and I would become the heavenly father. And my wife would become heavenly mother. And we would start having spirit babies. Billions of them. We would populate this new earth with our own spirit children who would have the same potential we do. And I would be worshipped as the God of that world. And um, my wife would be looked at as the heavenly mother. Now, interestingly, the whole thing also works in reverse. Our Heavenly Father, before he was God over our earth, he himself achieved celestial exaltation with his wife. But before that, our Heavenly Father used to live on some other earth somewhere, some other world somewhere. And when he lived on that world, he worshipped another God, his God. He was a good man. He was um, a worthy man. So when he dies, the other gods allow him to become a new God. And that's how our Heavenly Father became God. Now, one of the Mormon prophets, Lorenzo Snow, summarized the entire Mormon gospel with this famous couplet. Let me read it to you here. He says, um, As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. This is the uh, restored gospel. This is the law of eternal progression. Let me just ask you, does this match the same gospel found in the pages of the New Testament? God was once a man. And we can become gods ourselves one day if we're worthy. He said, well, in the Cyclopedia, it says your church teaches that God, before he was God, he was once a man. And that you too can become a God one day. I said, now, we, we do teach that, but we te you can only become a God if you're worthy and obedient. We believe that the same as your church. I thought all the churches taught that. He said, no, we only believe in one God. Well, yeah, yeah, one God for our earth, but it's a big universe. There's other worlds and other earths. And he goes, no, in our church, we believe there's only one true God. Every other God is a false God. I said, who told you that? I've never heard that before. He said, James is in the Bible. That is on his grandmother's porch. He takes the Bible and he shows me this. The seventh grader, seventh grader. Isaiah 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. Before me, there was no God formed. And there will be none after me. And Tom says, he's Tom, he says, James, if there's no God form before God, how was God once a man? If there's no God formed after God, how can you become a God yourself one day? I didn't know the answer to that question. And I didn't become a Christian that day or that week or that month or that year. Um, I didn't become a Christian. I didn't make that transition until I was 21 years old. But if I look back, I would have to say that Tommy was the one who planted the first seed. And that Bible verse stuck in my head. And uh, now, unfortunately, I lost track of Tommy shortly after the ninth grade. And Tommy would have never known you know, the rest of the story. Were it not many, many years later, one year for my birthday present that year, my wife wanted to do something special. She actually somehow hunted down my friend Tommy from seventh grade, got him on the phone. He had moved several times and she tracked him down, got him on the phone. Remember your Mormon friend in seventh grade? He's a Christian now. And he has a whole ministry of Watchman Fellowship reaching uh, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims and, and atheists. And remember that day on your grandmother's porch when you shared that you still, oh, he remembered it too. You planted a seed that day, Tommy. And anything good that ever comes out of the ministry of James Walker and Watchman Fellowship, you will always have a partnership in that because you were the one that planted that first seed. Now, there were other people that God used. There were many things. I was really disturbed to find out about the 4,000 changes in the Book of Mormon. That was devastating to me. 
The fact, the fact that the book of Abraham was actually mistranslated, that Joseph Smith did not get one word right when he said he could translate these Egyptian documents, that was devastating to me. But the final straw for me was grace. When I realized that I couldn't be saved after all I could do, even on my best day, I needed help. And I remembered that my Christian friends had shared with me that Jesus paid it all. And I just got desperate. And I said, I, I keep trying. I keep hoping. I keep working. But I can't do it. I can't do it. I need help. I need a Savior. And I put all my faith and trust. And I, I remember thinking, if, if Jesus can't do it, I, I have no plan B. I mean, it's just, it's just got to be Jesus. And I put my faith and trust in Christ. Uh, is it worth it? Should we try to reach our Latter-day Saint neighbors and friends? Absolutely. You will find the Mormon people will be some of the best friends you could ever have. Some of your best neighbors, people that you trust, uh, and they deserve to be able to know this. I'm thankful that I've had those kinds of friends, and I, I want to be one of those kinds of friends as well.